Good morning. How is everybody doing? Yeah, I'm going to invite you guys to stand. I'm so glad you guys are here. And those of you watching um, later, whether it be Monday, Tuesday, wherever, um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you guys would pray with me, and then we'll get started with our time of worship. Heavenly Father God, um, we're just thankful for this, uh, this time and space that we have just to be with you and to be in your presence. And God, I pray, um, God, that you would be here. God, that we would just... Um, God, we would just be aware of your presence this morning, and God, that we would um, hear what you want us to hear, and God, that we would worship you, um, God, with everything that we have. God, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. God, we ask again that you would be here, God, that you would speak to us, and God, we would hear from you. God, we love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You guys feel free to greet one another, go grab a donut. There are plenty back there, and I'm sure Wayne doesn't want to take them again this week. What do you guys think? You like that one? That's good, huh? Johnny Swim. I um, was thinking about it this week. I, the, you know, I, I've been a pastor for a long time, and I've pastored you know, discover for a long while, you know, we're not a very big community. I've pastored at a mega church, you know, as a campus pastor and spoke in front of, you know, lots and lots of people. Before that, I pastored at a church in California um, during the late 90s, early 2000s that was uh, in a place between San Francisco, California and San Jose that was called uh, Silicon Valley, still is, I guess. Um, and the church 
we did some things there that I think a lot of the ideas that even I have today kind of maybe took root. And back there at that church, just because of where we were, there were a lot, a lot, a lot of non-Christians that lived in the area. And that we were always trying to reach non-Christians. And we would even kind of tailor what we would do on Sunday mornings with people who didn't believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior uh, with them in mind. And so one of the things that we would do, we started doing, was we would take songs that were on the radio, secular songs, and we would do them in church, and I would try to, to do a message. It wasn't like, it wasn't soundtrack per se, but it was kind of like, that's sort of where the soundtrack idea came from. And I can remember we were doing a message on the prodigal son. And you know that story, I'm sure, because you guys are Christians, and uh, you've heard the Bible taught many, many times, I'm sure, and know Jesus teaching that story. Well, we took the Coldplay song, Clocks, and use, we actually, our band learned the song and performed the song, and then I tried to use it to kind of tie back to that. And I remember the guy in our band who actually was singing the song was kind of disturbed and came up to me afterwards and was like, how do you know that when those guys in Coldplay wrote this song, they were thinking about the, the prodigal son? I said, well, I'm pretty sure they weren't. He goes, they weren't? Well, then why did we sing that song? I said, well, because it worked. And they said, but, but if it wasn't written for that purpose, you know, what? what? And, I, and that was kind of the conversation that I remember having with Joe Stinnett that day in the parking lot after the, we had done the service um, is kind of where I think the whole idea for the soundtrack series grew out of. I said, you know, Joe, um, God is, the, is ultimately the, 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 the master creator of everything, including the arts. God is the one that somehow, someway took sounds and gave dissonance to them and resonance and, and could make them into notes that when paired just the right way would do something inside our brains where we would say, I like how those notes sound when they're together. Or certain notes they get played together, I would not like how they would kind of come together. I would have an emotional connection. And God is also the author of, of literature and art, and he can take all of that and weave it together, and it really, the way that he inspires somebody to write a song is immaterial, because God can take whatever is written, and whatever that guy had in mind, or that gal had in mind when she pinned those lyrics or wrote those notes together, God can take those messages, and the Holy Spirit, he, he does his thing in those words and in those notes, and communicates himself and his truths, because, you know, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth in the life. And we've talked about this on many occasions at Discover, that where we find truth, we find life. And so for years and years and years and years, I have taken music that oftentimes you know in the back of your mind, I'm sure when the dude wrote this song or the gal wrote this song, they were thinking about that person that, you know, they were in love with that they wanted to make out with, you know, and hope that this song would do the trick, you know, and, and it's okay because because we're going to find God's truth in it and take the lyrics and say, here is a whole different way of looking at this song. I told Tyler and Jeremy on Thursday at staff meeting, I said, this is the first time ever that I've ever done all of this stuff where I'm going to flip that hook around and say, actually, we're going to take this song and take the intended purpose that the songwriters had and, and use, use it that way to glorify God. This is a song that is a secular song. But I find that when you look at these lyrics, you absolutely can see the glory of God expressed when they talk about a love that has a different type of depth and a love that has a different type of end game than what culture thinks about so oftentimes. I mean, Abner and Amanda sing in that song, I want to love you till we come to a point where we end in devastation. If this works out right, if we find success, then at the end, one of us is going to be devastated because we're going to lose the other one. And that's going to be such a blow. But that means we won. We did it right. We went where it was supposed to go, where it was designed to go, where what we had over the course of our time together was so real and meant so much that for it to be over is devastating. That's how connected, that's how deep that we are. And you heard her in the little blurb I, I mentioned that, that she wrote that she talked about the song. And she said, you know, it's easy to talk about and think about love in a way that's all about, hey, baby, this feels so good. And there's pleasure there and there's joy there and there's happiness there. But it's, it's a whole other thing to think about love elevating to a place where you would say we are so deeply woven together 
that for that to come apart would be devastating. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't end that way, then is it really worth, is what we're doing together really worth the time that we're spending? No. So let's, let's love each other until it's devastating, right? And I thought, man, I want to do this song for soundtrack. So that's what we are going to unpack. And um, I'm going to do some more talking about some of that stuff and even more. But before we go any further, I want to ask you if you would pray with me. Father, thank you for the wonder of love. Thank you for art, for music and note and lyric and how it all gets woven together um, in sometimes ways that have seemingly nothing to do with you, in other moments and other times in ways that are so obviously about you. But thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have that power to um, always draw us to you in any and every circumstance. And I pray that this morning, um, because we look at the things that we're going to look at in your word um, and the things that we're going to think about that you've taught us over the courses of our lives, particularly if we've ever um, been involved in a relationship, um, that these are things that are gifts from you. And they are about knowing you more deeply and about loving you. God, I pray these things in your name. Amen. So, uh, you know, it's really funny. I mentioned that staff meeting. We were talking, and Tyler was saying this, and I thought, man, that's, that's good, Tyler, that's good. He was saying, it was Grey's Anatomy, I think, that you talked about, that you'd watched, and, um, you know, how our culture and our society, I think they were doing a, a binge fest on Grey's Anatomy, and how our, and Grey's Anatomy's not a new show, right? I mean, are they still making it? 18 seasons. <laughs> are they on season 18 still? Yeah, okay, so it's not new, but they're still making it. And it's, well, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, love is something that, you know, any show that's been around for 18 years at some point is going to, you know, do some exploration on, you know, and try to, to look at. Because, I mean, love is the, it's the ideal in our world. It is the ultimate thing that we're all hungry for and looking for, right? And make love, not war, right? I mean, in all kinds of different facets and all kinds of different actions, right? And as the ultimate thing, Tyler was saying, isn't it interesting how there's this desperate pursuit for love? And in our art, we'll see people go to extreme lengths to find love. And once they do, it is this incredibly wonderful defining thing. But the moment that all of a sudden it's not fulfilling, that's an indication that love is over and it's time to move on. And that's universal. That's the way our world works. Love starts. Love's great. Love is all-encompassing. Love is incredibly fulfilling. And then it's not incredibly fulfilling. It's not all-encompassing. And okay, I guess that means it's, it's ended Let's go find something else now and just take it out the other stuff with the trash because it's over. It doesn't go until it's devastating. And that's, frankly, you know, just wi widely accepted. And it is the rule of thumb, not just for Grey's Anatomy, but for everything in our society. That's the way it works. Whether you're talking about, you know, things that, and, and you've heard me talk about a fondness that I have for peanut butter before. You know, if I could say I love peanut butter, you know, what if I love this particular brand of peanut butter? And then a better brand comes along. Maybe I don't love that old brand anymore, right? Think about a love for an animal, right? You love that animal, you care about that animal, but that animal does their business in the wrong place, the per perfect place of your house. Do I feel I love that animal anymore? Mm, maybe not, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? And then, of course, unfortunately, too many times in the context of relationships with people that you're, you know, supposedly in love with, that then all of a sudden, maybe I'm not in love with them anymore. Maybe I'm, I'm triggered by them. Maybe I'm triggered at myself because I've seen something else that, ooh, that looks even more attractive. And now I'm wondering about, is it, it's not you, it's me, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? We have all kinds of, of things that we look at and we unpack. That idea is totally based around this, this individual feeling of the way, whatever it is, this person or this thing, this emotion, this feeling makes me feel. If it makes me feel stardust and wonders and unicorns and rainbows, then I am in love. But if that thing stops making me feel that way, then I'm no longer in love. 
That is the basis of how our culture processes and understands and even defines love. It's, love is when it's the ultimate, it's, it's more than like, it's more than really like, right? It's, it's extreme, but that's the way. It's about how it makes me feel. Nothing could be further from what God's definition of love is. And if God's the creator of art, guess who's also the creator of love? God is. And the scriptures make clear to us what God says love is about. In John chapter 15, Jesus laid this out in the 9th through the 13th verses. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now, remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. So here, Jesus gives us words that, you know, I know you guys in the room are all familiar with, and I'll bet most of you watching, you know, have some familiarity with these words as well. They're kind of well ingrained, they're well understood, but yet they're not widely practiced, not in our culture, not in our society. And Jesus says, let me just give you this crash course. It starts, it originates in the relationship that God has as himself in that beautiful picture of Trinity. Um, the Holy Spirit's a part of this equation as well, but Jesus starts explaining it and saying, listen, as the you know, manifestation here, let me explain as the second person of the Trinity, let me make this clear. I love the Father, and the Father loves me. And there is some principles that are exemplified in that expression of love. And anything else isn't love. This is how the Creator works this out. First, you, to understand this, you need to recognize, as I'm talking about it, I'm talking it to you about the context that is relationship. And that's really a big deal. It's not individually, how do you make me feel? It is mutually, how do we both participate in this feeling that is being developed? this love that is starting to grow. And that's really important that we recognize right from the get-go that God's understanding, God's definition of love requires mutuality between at least two parties, particularly two parties. There has to be this sense that we're both in this and that we are both participating. Now, what is participation? Culturally, participation is consumption. You do this for me. You taste like whatever when you bite into me, says the peanut butter. And then Scott says, aha, I like that feeling. I like that taste. I love you. Consumption. But Jesus is talking about something else when he's talking about participation. He's talking about giving. And the second thing that we recognize in this mutuality is that love is demonstrable in the actions that the two parties perform towards one another. The most famous verse in the Bible illustrates this, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he did something. He gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know this verse. I mean, you know it inside out. You know it so well that you don't even think about it anymore. I can just say John 3, 16. You don't even wait for me to read it. You know those words. But look again at those words. Again, fresh today. God what? He loved. So did he, what did he do? He gave. And that is everything. That is the essence of how you are in love. You give to the other that you are in that mutual relationship with. Pure and simple. You don't consume, you give. You give and you give. Now, there is something that happens, Jesus said, when you give. You start being filled. You start being filled specifically with his joy. He talked about this. He said, me and the Father, man, we've got this thing going on. And as a result of this mutual relationship where we give to each other, love happens. I am in his love. He is in mine. It's beautiful. And we give that to each other. It's about, for me, him. For him, it's about me. Not for me, it's about me. What can he do for me? But for me, it's about him. What can I give to him? 
It's a, it's a whole different sort of thing that's happening there. And then he says, listen, this idea becomes transferable. It becomes something that not only do you feel, but it becomes something that you give away even to others. And we got that back in verse 12. He said, my command then is this, love each other as I have loved you. And I think it's so great that Jesus says this. He uses a word that we just, by our selfish nature, don't like a whole lot. He doesn't say, my suggestion is this. He doesn't even say, my request is this. He says, listen, I've got authority on this. I am the creator of love, and I made this. I made it to be everything you've ever dreamed it to be. I've made it to be everything you've ever wanted it to be. I've made it to be the thing that you think it can be. But in order for it to work, it only will work this way. So this is an instruction that I command. Love on others in this same way that I have loved on you. I have loved on you the way the Father has loved on me. The Father has given to me. He has given at a sacrificial level. And now the sacrifice has continued. I am loving on you guys by sacrificing myself. There's no greater love than this. I'm laying it all down. I am saying my needs are not as, as preeminent as yours. I will take my existence and then offer that back to you guys and say, here it is. This is how much I love you. I'm putting you in front of me and my needs. Do this same thing is my command. And do this for other people. Now that does not look like what we are constantly being told love is, does it? You know this. I mean, just look around. You know, the question is not, okay, does that look different? The question then becomes, that matters, I guess, is are we loving differently than what? the world is saying love is? Are we loving like Jesus is talking about here? Are we loving with that idea that is found that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 13? Paul said, let me tell you what love is. I want to show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now this is pretty, just, just think about this for a minute. Paul said, if I am like the best orator, orator, I'm clearly not this morning, if I'm the best speaker that there's ever been, if I've got it going on, if if I am so eloquent that it's just crazy, but I don't love, then I am absolutely worthless. I'm just noise. I'm just noise. He says, if I am only, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Again, think about this. He's saying, if I have godly superpower, if I've got the ability to discern everything, if I've got the ability to like, you know, make mountains move from one place to the other just by the power of my faith, but I don't love, then I am not just insignificant or I'm not just insufficient he says I'm literally nothing there's nothing there I'm nothing if I give all that I to I have to, to the poor and I surrender my body to the flames but have not love I gain nothing now, this is huge too right if if you're you know trying to walk around this world and be like super like you know I donate all over the place I'm you know I, I vote for the right party I um you know wear the right badge and the right button right but I'm you know there's not love in it, then it's worthless. Then it's worthless. I mean, this is pretty deep stuff. And then he says, here's, here's how you, you, you know this, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Look at that list. Do you experience that? Do you feel that? Do you know that? Do you give that away to those people in your life that you would say, I love? Do you love like that? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. All of that stuff is about giving. All of that stuff is about somebody else. It's not about the way you consume. It's about the way you give. 
And when you give like that, it doesn't fail. It leads you to this place where, you know, it's devastating. I want to dial back to what Jesus said there in John again, right? He said there's no greater love, nothing else out there that comes close to the kind of experience that says I would lay it all down for somebody else. And I believe with everything that I am that God in his infinite wisdom said, you know what? I want to let people love each other. I want there to be marriage. I want there to be troth, which is the, the concept that existed in the Old Testament before new, the, the, I, that newfangled thing called marriage ever existed, um, which if you break down the old Hebrew and you look at that word troth, which is where it gets woven into the word betrothal, um, troth literally means a complete and total oneness. It is a physical oneness, but it's also a emotional or a relational oneness, and it is a spiritual oneness. It is where individual entities no longer have that individuality. It is where they come together and they become you know, one essence. And that's this whole idea of, of the, the vehicle where love is supposed to be experienced. And I believe that God said, you know, the greatest thing I could do to help people grasp this concept is give them the idea, give them the ability to have that, that expression in their own lives because then they'll be able to understand just how much I love them. Uh, you know, I mean, there are, um, it's funny, so many moments, Cindy, I've been talking about this week, uh, you know, we'll be celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary this year. It's crazy that she has stuck with me that long. Uh, you know, it has been devastating on her to be with me that long, right? And um, when we, you know, look back at our lives and, you know, we watched that video and it was kind of cute watching, you know, the, the Johnny Swim couple um, who've been married, I think, 12 years, um, you know, in their wedding videos and all that sort of stuff. And we just think, oh, those young pups, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, there's some people in the room today looking around who um, have been married longer than we have. And no, you guys, are, you're not in front of us. But, um, and then there's some people that, um, that's right. Is it today is your anniversary? Ooh, oh, 20. Okay, so I guess we've been married longer than you guys. Okay. We're the old, we're the, wow. <laughs> it does, it does, you know. And then there are some people in the room that are, are single who, you know, ha haven't had the wonderful, blissful experience of having to be married to somebody like me for any length of time yet. And when, you know, you look at that gamut of things and you recognize, you know, there's good. And there's, there's sweet stuff that you just think, man, that was awesome today. I hope we get to experience that again tomorrow. This is great. And then there's stuff that happens that you just think, I hope that never happens ever again in my existence. Um, kids, right? <laughs> they have this thing, right? And, um, you know, there's just so much stuff that you just unpack. And it's crazy to me. You, you listen to the lyric of that song that she sang at the very beginning. She says, you know, I'm looking for excitement and I'm looking for a thrill. And it's usually, you know, because there is a, there can be, frankly, all, all true candor and honesty. And I'm not going to tell you anything that I don't think anybody in this room doesn't know. Boredom comes in every, every type of way where something will happen and you'll think, yeah, you know what, it's just the same old, same old. Is there something out there better? Is there something out there that might, you know, and frankly, I just think as a whole world, a lot of us right now are engaging and dealing with boredom over our relationships with God. You know, I mean, look around. I, mean, I think that's why there's 12 of us in the room, right? I mean, you know, when there used to be 50, you know? Um, I think there are a lot of folks that are just like, yeah, maybe there's something else I could be doing today than doing Jesus, at least in this moment. I'll catch up with him later, right? And, and that's a broad, you know, brushstroke. I get it. Um, but then I just look at how easy is it to go through the motions? Just because we're sitting here right now, does that even mean that we love Jesus? Just because I've logged on and I'm watching a video about you know, a guy preaching in a church someplace, does that mean that I love Jesus, right? Um, you have to be intentional. The, one of the greatest things that I've, I, and I go back to this all the time, I'm so glad that the scriptures included that moment where Jesus goes to the garden the night before he's going to lay it all down for us and says, is there a plan B? Is there another way, Father, that we could do this? Is there any way I could let this cup pass? I mean, they're great and all, 
But <laughs> I don't know if I want to give that much, right? But then what does he say? But you know what? Not my will, but your will be done. He doesn't say, not my will, but their will be done. He doesn't say, not my needs, but their needs. And we needed him. We need him today. We need him every day. But it wasn't about what we needed. Jesus said, not my will or not my needs. He said, but your will to the Father be done. Gang, the only way we will ever, ever love a spouse, a friend, God, is if we don't worry about what we need, as far as excitement, as far as, you know, an answer to the boredom thing, as far as a, a, just something new and fresh. But if we calibrate ourselves daily, moment by moment even, on what He, the Father, wills. And this is huge because I really think this is where so many of us, you know, drop the ball in our personal relationships with each other or even in our relationships with God is we have stopped saying, God, what is it that you command? The secret, not to being happy, but to being filled with his joy, Jesus said, is to follow the command. And the command is this, love each other the way I have loved you. Sacrifice and give. There are times when I know she has not wanted to sacrifice for me. I know it. And I know there have been, and she knows this, there have been times when I haven't wanted to sacrifice for her. All those of you in the room who are in, in a loving relationship with somebody, you know, same drill for you guys. All of you who'd ever watched this, same drill for you. There are times when you just say, no, I want to think about me right now. I don't want to think about them, and I want what I want, right? Not what they need or what they want, what I want. But that's never what he wills. His command is that I love her she loves me. I love you. You love me. We love him in a way that follows that command that says, I'll lay down my needs. I'll lay down my wants. I'll lay down everything for what he wills. I'm going to sacrifice and give the same way that he did. Not my needs. Not my wants, for sure. His, right? And then what happens, Jesus says, the floodgates reopen and joy sets in. Do I love her the same way that I did 30 years ago this January? You know, no, I don't. Nor does she love me. I'd like to think we love each other a whole lot more deeply and a whole lot more profoundly than we did then. Why? Because there have been enough moments where we've pushed through the boredom and we've pushed through the old familiarity and we've allowed God to fill those holes with his joy. And it only comes when I say, you know, you're more important than me. What do you need? And she does the same thing, right? And you've experienced this, I'm sure, so, so many of you listening to this. Um, but maybe we all need that refresher course because this is about what Cindy and I have for Cindy and I. It's about understanding more deeply what I need to be doing with him, what she needs to be doing with him, what all of us need to be doing with him. Give love sacrificially, and his joy will be our joy. That's the gift. And Jesus says at that point, exactly, Scott, that's now how you know how much I love you. And it will be sweet and it will be deep every day, even until it's devastating. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for love. And thank you that um, what you have in mind for us is not trite. It is not simple. It is easy to experience, hard to hold on to, but so worth it. That it is... There's, there's, there, there's nothing easy about sacrifice. It, it can be devastating to say, I'm going to stick around even when it hurts. But 
there's something there that you want us to know. There's something there that you want us to see about how you care about us, where the whims of happiness have long since burned off, but the depth of joy remains, and it sustains, and it propels us deeper into um, not just bliss with each other, but bliss with you. God, I pray that we would be reminded of that, and I pray that we would hunger for that, and I pray that we would be open to that, um, not just this day, but every day. God, thank you for um, just the joys that we can celebrate. For Wayne and Tammy, celebrating 29 years. How, how beautiful is that? Um, Lord God, um, thank you for all those anniversaries. Thank you for you loving us for 2,000 years and counting, <laughs> um, and even longer than that. Praise you, God. Seriously, praise you for the gift of love. May we know it and cling to it and experience it now. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would y'all please stand? Fight! 
God, we're so thankful for your love. God, a love that is unconditional, never-ending, always there, always perfect. God, and I pray that we could love others in the same way. God, that every day in, in, our, in our marriages, in our relationships, and in our, our work lives, in our home lives, God, and just in every way, we would love you, and God, we would love others. God, we love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.